Good morning, it's Friday, and I don't know about you, but I'm ready to take a break for a day or two. We've been at it uh, pretty good this week, trying to hit a quota, and then we've also been trying to change over our phone system. So to say that it's been a little crazy uh, at the office this week is a major understatement. But what's new? You know, we're living in a world where there's all kinds of craziness, and um, we are going to try our best um, to get there. So, um, you know, I just had a thought, and some of you biblical scholars can jump in here if you uh, want to offer something. But when David does the census yesterday, and that's kind of where we left off, if you recall, when David does that census, it's kind of interesting. God got mad at him for doing that. But I wonder if where the devil's trying to destroy all the Jewish people to break God's promises to them, if maybe that was why. So if you know something about that and the census, some of you Bible experts, please feel free to drop that information in there and we'll go from there. So Biff, it's great to see you this morning. Have you had snow yet in Cleveland? That's what we all wanna know. Especially Stephanie, who who's on the beach down there at Pensacola. I'm sure she would love to see some pictures of some snow. And speaking of pictures, man, did you all see the sky yesterday morning? absolutely beautiful sky so uh, it's all good so we're going to get into the first book of kings and i'll be honest with you i hope this bible study is doing something for you but it's really kind of recommitted me to to the things of this bible because we're going to start through the book of kings which is about 900 years before jesus shows up on the earth down to the last one about 600 years before Jesus shows up. So we're gonna talk about 300 years of Hebrew history, history where uh, God didn't want them to have a king. They had direct access to God, the man are speaking. They had the prophets, they had all these things. And so they decide um, <laughs> that they're gonna, that they need a king. So um, this is kind of where we're going today. The kingdom is going to be divided here after David. David had united the kingdom, and if you recall in the beginning, there was still some warring going on. Some didn't want to recognize David. Some wanted to fight for the house of Saul. But just like our politics today, what's really going on there is some of the political um, supporters of Saul, <clears throat> they didn't want to lose their position, right? And then some people who wanted to get out from under David's thumb and start their own deal, they backed uh, David's son, and that's kind of where that goes. So David's first four sons were Amnon, Chiliab, Absalom, and Adijah, Ananijah, Anna, Adana, Adonijah, maybe is how you pronounce it. So there's his four sons, okay? Abnon and Absalom had suffered violent deaths, right? We just covered that. So Cheliab must have died in childhood. Therefore, Adonijah would assume that he had the legitimate right to the throne. However, even Adonijah knew that the Lord had selected Solomon as David's successor. Now, Solomon's just a kid in all this, okay? But we're getting into more drama, more of David's family situation where he had all these wives from all these different nationalities and what's the problem with people from different countries it's not that there's a problem it's that they just think different you know we've all got different customs we all have different beliefs and so when these kids grow up they all have one thing in common and that is they all want to get to power right and i mean that ain't that's not really a, a different feeling than you and i have today we all want to get the power and that's sort of where we're going with this. So, uh, now King David was old. He was stricken in years, and they covered him with cloths, uh, um, I guess, to cool him down there, you know, as he's getting older. And wherefore his servants said unto him, Let there be sought for my lord the king a young virgin, and let her stand before the king, and let her, let her cherish him, and let her lie in thy bosom, that the Lord may be, um, uh, may, get heat. So once again, you know, this is one of those things in the Bible, you read that, uh, it's supposed to get in the 30s. Yeah, we've had some cool mornings too. But chapter one, first Kings, David's getting old and they've suggested this young girl to come to David. And once again, this is something in the Bible that you're looking at and you're like, 
man, God said that uh, fornicators don't get into heaven. He says adulterers don't get into heaven. So what's up here? And I, and I can't answer that. You know, I, I don't know. But there it is. So by the time we get over here to Adonijah, Adonijah, maybe, I don't know. My, my, my letters are running together. So Adon, Adon, Adonijah plots to seize the throne. What's new, right? So Adonijah, the son of Haggath, exalted himself, saying, I will be the king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. Interesting note, I will be king. If you go over and look at a picture, you want to see a, a picture of Satan and, and how God set him up. If you go to Isaiah 14, chapter 12, you're going to see that at some point in time past, God set up Lucifer over maybe this world before you know Adam and Eve. I don't know how he did it, when he did it, or whatever, but it's recorded there in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, how that... Um, Lucifer was given this mighty position and sort of in our 21st century lingo, we would say it went to his head and he said the same thing that Adonijah said, okay? Uh, Adonijah, Adonijah. Man, I can't get that in my head. I think there's too many I's and too many J's in there. But anyway, so he says, I will be king. And I'm telling you right now, if you want to follow Jesus, you better get rid of two words together in your dictionary and that is I will okay I will do what I want I will be important I will I will I will and you better start saying Lord if it be thy will what will thou will for me be right so be careful with this thing okay because this is the beginning of the end for everybody who thinks that hey this is the way it's going to be so we go a little bit further. Nathan the prophet uh, hears about this and all the mighty men and, and Solomon, um, you know, is going to be the heir. I mean, it's just the way it's going to be. Just call him Joey. I hear you. Uh, I mean, that is crazy. A-D-O-N-I-J-A-H. Adonijah. Adonijah. Close enough. Joey. <laughs> All right, so here's how it's setting up, okay? Nathan the prophet gets involved, and, and, you know, wherefore Nathan spake unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that, a don't, that Joey, <laughs> have you not heard that Joey, the son of Haggath, doth reign, and David, our Lord, doesn't even know it? Are you hearing this here, Bathsheba? Because... Nathan knows what Bathsheba is. She's a little slick herself, you know. We talk about David breaking all Ten Commandments when he sees her naked on the rooftop taking a bath. But guess what? Do you reckon that there's anybody in the world ever saw somebody naked and that somebody who was naked didn't know who was looking? Very few times, probably, right? So Bathsheba knows how to get it done in so many, so many ways. So go and get thee into the king David and say unto the king, Didst thou not, my lord, O God, swear unto thy handmaid? Did you not promise me, David, that my son Solomon would be the king? Because we got a problem out here. Because what's happening is um, <laughs> your son Joey is basically telling people he's the king and he's formed a little band of of army people himself, and he's got this thing going on, and you better jump in here and get started. Benita, Jennifer, Biff, Stephanie, great to see you guys this morning. We're in 1 Kings chapter 1. We're coming down near the end of David's life, and David's got one son left that was an older son, but, you know, everybody knows it's going to be Solomon, even this older son, but the older son says, hey, this is my time. I will be king. So, when this goes to um, Nathan, the prophet finds it out. He goes to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. Solomon, or Bathsheba, goes to David. Then King David says to Bathsheba as she comes to him. And uh, call me Bathsheba. And she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swore and said, As the Lord liveth that hath redeemed my soul out of all of the distress, even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, 
assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my steed, so I will certainly do this day. <laughs> I mean, this is it. So then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and did reverence to the king and said, let my Lord, King David, live forever. Well, guess what? King David, his throne does live forever through Jesus Christ, who was, if you run the genealogy down, was related to David on both sides. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's true. So, here we go. Now we're down to verse 32, and the King David uh, calls uh, call me Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benini uh, the son of Jehoadi, and they came before the king. The king also said unto them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and cause Solomon my son to ride up on my own mule and to bring him down to Gihon. So bring him down here. Let's get this thing moving. So Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel. And they blow ye with the trumpet and say, God save King Solomon. So if you ever wondered where that came from, God saved the king, it came from the Bible. Like a lot of great things have come from the Bible. All the things that are going to matter to get us into heaven are in this Bible, right? So man rips it off. The movies rip stuff off, and we all love a good movie, right? But anyway, God saved the king, right? There's probably the first time I've read it. Um, so there you, there you go. So then shall you come up after him that he may come and sit upon my throne, that he shall be king of my steed, and I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. And Benini, the son of Jehoiada, answered the king, and he said, Amen, the Lord God of my Lord, the king, say, say so too. So as the Lord hath been with my Lord, the king, even so be with Solomon, and make thy throne greater than the throne of my Lord and King David. So that's pretty strong prayer, isn't it? Zadok the priest says, I want this to be the greatest kingdom, Lord. We're praying that you make it the greatest kingdom in the world. So by the time we get down to verse 40, little Joey, let's go with Joey. Every time I think of Joey, I can't help but think of Joey from Friends. Good morning, Myrtle. How are you feeling today? Man, we've been thinking about you this week, but there ain't nobody tougher than Myrtle. Ain't nobody tougher than those Johnson girls from Milton, West Virginia. Maureen, good to see you. I hope you and Glenn are doing good. We are in 1 Kings. We're in chapter 1. We're setting this thing up. Uh, Ad 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 Adonijah. I think that's how you pronounce that now that I think about that. Adonijah, which was the last or the oldest son of David, feels like the throne's his. He says, I'm the king. You know, I'm going to be the, the, the king. And Nathan the prophet goes to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and says, hey, you better get to the king because... Adonijah is over here doing something and you better get this thing lined out because you're going to have an issue. Bathsheba goes in, says, David, you promised. David says, hey, it's not me promising. God's decided on Solomon. So there ain't nothing we can do about it, but we want him in there so that now they've done it. So now it gets down here uh, to Solomon and he sits on the throne in the kingdom and uh, oh, I had a verse there I wanted to read you. Because I know it's hard to read. Oh, here it was. It says, And Adonijah, Adonijah, and all the guests that were with him heard it as if they had made an end of the eating. And when Joab heard the sound of the trumpet, he said, Wherefore is this noise of the city being in an uproar? So Joab had, been, had a pretty good position, and Joab's like, Hey, what's going on? And while he yet spake, behold, Jonathan, the son of Abiathar, the priest, came, and Adonijah said unto him, Come in, for what are the valiant men uh, bringing good tidings? And Jonathan answered, and he said to Adonijah, He says, Verily our Lord King David has made Solomon the king. So guess what? Adonijah is not happy, right? So, and the king hath sent with him Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benani the son of Jehoiada, and the Cherith, Cherithites and the Pelethites, and they have caused him to ride upon the king's mule. Man, they're having a parade even. I mean, this is going down, it's happening, and there ain't nothing can stop it. And now Solomon's even sitting on the throne in the kingdom. So moreover, the king's servants came to bless our Lord King David, saying, God 
make the name of Solomon better than thy name and make his throne greater than thy throne. And the king bowed himself upon the bed. And he also said, let the king of Israel be the Lord God of Israel, which hath given one to sit on the throne this day. And my eyes saw this. So I'm here to tell you, Joey, that this is the way it's going to be. And this is messed up. So all the guests that were with Adonijah were afraid. Whoa, Adonijah, you said you were king and we were hanging out with you because you said you had some power. And now the word's out that we've done what we've done and there's a new king in town and there's a good chance we might all get killed here. So the fear spreads, right? Because that's what it says. The guests were afraid. And they rose up and went every man his way. So they scattered. Oh, man, Adonijah, I wanted to party with you when you was the king, but, man, now that you don't have any power and you might get us all killed, we're out of here, <laughs> okay? So now little Joey's a little scared because, you know, it don't take long to figure out that, you know, he made a power move, and sometimes when you make a power move and it don't work out, then you got a problem. So he arose and he went and he caught hold on the horns of the altar, Right? So because of Solomon, he rose and he went and he sought to hold on to the horns of the altar. And it was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah feareth King Solomon, for lo, he hath caused him to hold on to the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear unto me today that he will not slay his servant. So Joey says, Man, I better make a deal here. And the deal is the altar, I guess, must have been a place of refuge where he could grab that and, you know, maybe... The king, Solomon, you know, had to grant mercy. Who knows what the deal was? But Solomon responds this way. He says, if he will show himself a worthy man, there shall not be a hair of his head fall to the earth. But if wickedness shall be found in him, he shall die. Right? So King Solomon sent and they brought him down from the altar and he came and he bowed himself to King Solomon. And Solomon said to him, go to thine house. So apparently, you know, Solomon, he recognized the power of Solomon. He bows down. He worships, probably pledges allegiance. Solomon says, you know what? You know, let's let it ride for a while and see what happens. So chapter 2 comes, and the days of David are just about done. David is ready to go be with the Lord, and uh, he charged Solomon, his son. So he, he gives him a charge or a commission to say, here's the way, you know, here's what I'd do if I was you, so to speak, Right? So he says, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. Be strong, show yourself a man, right? And keep the charge of the Lord thy God, right? Ironic that David's telling Solomon, right, that this very thing. So David had seen sometimes when he'd gotten off track, but nonetheless, his kingdom is guaranteed forever. It will never fail, and it will always have the king of kings in there because Jesus is in the line. So keep the charge of the Lord to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, keep his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest and whithersoever thou turnest thyself, that the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, if my children take heed to their walk and walk before me in truth and with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee a man on the throne of Israel. How come the United States has problems today? Because our elected leaders do not walk in the truth. They do not follow the commandments. They do not do the things that God has for them to do. You say, we're not Hebrews, and this doesn't apply. If it is written in the Bible as a guide for our leaders 2,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, it is good for today. And that's our biggest problem. Once again, not to bring it on down to my own political run for office, but do you realize that Christians ought to, every Christian should have wanted a Jesus first sign in their yard? Not because of Brooke Lunsford, but because Jesus had, you know, <laughs> has the way of healing the land, Second Chronicles 7, 14, right? But anyway, that's another story. So we go a little bit further down the road, and by the, by the second chapter of 1 Kings, David slept 
with his fathers and he was buried in the city of David. This is verse 10. And the days that David reigned over Israel were 40 years. Boy, I tell you what, a lot happened in 40 years. You know, I got saved when I'm 30. I'm 54. So for 24 years, I've been saved and under the protection of the Lord. But I'm still living with the consequences of the things that I did for my first 30 years. And plus, there's things that I've done, you know, since then that I've had to live with those consequences. So those things happen. <clears throat> but man, with all the things that went on in David's life, it's really amazing that his reign wasn't longer than 40 years, if you think about it. But it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. So once again, if you're picking up on the numbers, we had a lesson on it. 40 days is, is like a judgment period, okay? They wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, okay? It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. So his reign was complete right? In those 40 years. So uh, he reigned in Hebron 30 and three years and he reigned in Jerusalem. So it kind of broke it up. So for 40 years, okay, seven years, he reigned in Hebron 33 years, he reigned in Jerusalem because I guess in the beginning there it was divided and maybe they're saying that it brought it back together. But nonetheless, he had 40 total years uh, as king. So then Solomon sets upon the throne of David, his father, and his kingdom was established greatly. So Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and she said, do you come to me peaceably? And he said, peaceably. And he said, moreover, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And she said, say on. Now, this is Solomon's mother, right? And Adonijah has come to her and, and wants to talk. So he said, Thou knowest that the kingdom was mine, and that all Israel set their faces upon me that I should reign. How be it that the kingdom is turned about and has become my brother's? For it was his from the Lord. And now I ask one petition of thee, and deny me not. And she said, Say on. And he said, Speak, I pray thee, unto Solomon the king, for he will not say no to thee, that he give me... Abishab, the Shunammite, to wife. And Bathsheba said, Well, I will speak for thee unto the king. So Bathsheba therefore went unto King Solomon to speak unto him for Adonijah. And the king rose up to meet her and bowed himself unto her and sat down under his throne and caused a seat. Then she said, I desire one, um, I desire one petition. King Solomon answered her and said, Mother, what you know? What can I do? And then King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, God, do so to me, and more also, if Adonijah hath not spoken this word against his own life. So now therefore, okay, as the Lord liveth, which hath established me and set me on the throne of David my father, who hath made me a house as he had promised, little Joey shall be put to death this day. Okay, and King Solomon sent by the hand of Ben and I, the son of Jehoiada, and he fell upon him and he died. Okay, now, um, what's going on? King Solomon answered his mother and said unto his mother, Why dost thou ask Abishab the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is mine elder brother, even for him and for the Abiathar, the priest, and for Joab, the son of Jerai. So, you know, Adonijah is requesting that David's concubine, let me give you some footnotes on this, this is why we need to study Bible. How's this getting killed? Is because uh, little Joey asks for David's concubine, which is Abishab, um, to be given to him. So it constituted a virtual claim upon the throne. Because if you get the things of the king, see Bathsheba apparently doesn't know this custom, but here it is. So Abiathar had participated in Adonijah's plot to seize the throne, and because he had previously supported David, his life was spared. His banishment from the active priesthood fulfilled the prophecy concerning the house of Eli. Remember how they all perished because Eli's sons were crooked, right? And once again, uh, we get into Joab, okay, and Joab is also put to death because Joab's guilt could not secure protection for him at the horns of the altar. So once again, I guess that's where the protection was, was at the horns of the altar. 
So again, Joab fled once he realizes that little Joey is put to death. Once he realizes that they know Abiathar, the priest was in on it, and they're going to know that Joab is in on it. And so, you know, not only that, but then they go and they put somebody else, which is Shema. He's also put to death. So the plot is put down, okay, uh, in a mighty way. And, and you know, Solomon is a, is a child, but at the same time, you know, there's no doubt about it. He knows somebody's taught him something. Rather, whether it's David or whatever, but you know he he wants to give little Joey a chance. Joey can't make it, and so he drops the hammer on the whole the whole deal. So by the time we get over to chapter three, Solomon marries Pharaoh's daughter. So once again, Solomon has taught some things about making alliances with other people. So Solomon made affinity, <coughs> excuse me, which is a trinity, a trinity a treaty or an alliance. So he makes the alliance with Pharaoh, which is king of Egypt, and he took Pharaoh's daughter and he brought her into the city of David until he made an end of building his own house in the house of the Lord and the walls of Jerusalem round about. Only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord until those days. Now remember this, because David wanted to build the palace to God, but he'd had the innocent blood of Uriah on his hand. So David doesn't get to build this. But now Solomon, in all his glory and all his power, you know, this is going to happen under Solomon's watch. And I think it's alluding to it here, but I think we get a description of it. Maybe it's in a different book, but it's but it's coming. So um, who's Egypt? Remember, we came out of Egypt, okay? The Hebrew children had come out of Egypt. Uh, what would this have been? If this is roughly a thousand years before Jesus, then let's see, we went back to 3,500 years, 1,500 years before Jesus is Moses. So it's about 500 years earlier um, that you know they're in bondage to Egypt and now Solomon's making a deal and, um, and, and, and he's married Pharaoh's daughter to, to firm up this alliance and this treaty. So uh, Solomon prays for wisdom. And I remember this. I read it in a little Sunday school book. I prayed for wisdom all my life. I wanted to know, wanted to know, even before I was saved. So now I don't know if that helped me any. I don't know <coughs> if it kept me out of things. <coughs> but I'd like to think I have some pretty good insight on some things. But yet at the same time, the ADD that I have just keeps me bounced back and forth, so I haven't been able to channel that wisdom. Definitely not like uh, Solomon's going to channel it, right? <clears throat> so, what makes Solomon's relationship with the Lord powerful is because of verse 3. Solomon loved the Lord, and he loved him so much that he walked in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and burned incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, God said to Solomon, Ask what you will, and I will give it to you. Can you imagine God coming to you and saying, Ask me anything you want, I'm going to give it to you. Man. And he's a young man here, and I don't even know what age he is at this point, but I mean, he's young, right? Maybe he's a teenager still. I don't know. I mean, he's old enough to be married here, but he's king, so he could theoretically do whatever he wanted. But um, God says to him, and right here it is. It's chapter 3, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. The Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask me what you shall ask me. Ask what I shall give thee. You, you tell me what you want, Solomon. Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto the servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. And now, O Lord, my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father, and I am but a little child. 
I don't even know how to go out or how to come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for the multitude. Give therefore thy servant Solomon an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge this to be so great a people? Who's, who's got the ability to judge a people that is so great in number and has so blessed as you've blessed these people, Lord? Man, there is nothing. I, I mean, I'm not worthy. Boy, it's a whole lot different than little Joey had in mind, wasn't it? I am the king. I'm the right for and I'm going to run this place the way I want. And I don't care what happens. Sounds a little different when, when Solomon's praying, right? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked for the wisdom to help and to lead the people. And because God said that you have asked this thing and you haven't asked for yourself a long life, you haven't asked riches, you haven't asked for the lives of your enemies, but you've asked for an understanding heart to discern judgment, behold, I have done according to your words. And not only do you get that wisdom that that probably makes you the sharpest guy in the whole history of the world, but I'm going to give you everything else that a king would want and would ask for. All these things that you could ask for, I'm, I'm still giving those to you. Man, that's pretty strong, isn't it? Now, for you and I today, let's think about that. God give us a kingdom. I'm the king of this house. Remember that, that old thing? I'm the king of this throne or whatever it is, you know? Man is the king of his castle. That's what it was. So once again, God gave you a lot? Absolutely. Did we deserve it? Absolutely not. Are we thankful for what God's given me? How often do we say to God, you know, God, look what you've done for me. Man, you put me in Salt Rock, West Virginia. Nobody shot at the house last night. You put me, you know, in business where I was able to use my creative my mind and good or bad, right? You know, you've allowed me to just do all kinds of these great things. And Lord, I'm so thankful. And I'm just, but I want to do what you want me to do. I want your will to be done in my life. And you lead me and you guide me and you direct me. And man, I mean, you can start to see just, you know, why that Solomon had such a direct line to God because he loved God. And he had seen the times when David was following God and doing the things God wanted done. And just how powerful it was that you know, God's in control of this situation. God is making this stuff happen. And so it's, and so it's really awesome. So, uh, behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there may be none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like you. See, there ain't nobody as smart as you in the past, Solomon, and there's nobody going to come after you that's going to be any smarter. I'm going to give you the wisdom and the understanding, and I'm going to allow you, man, oh man, you know, because you have asked humbly, you asked everything that I would have wanted from a servant, you have basically offered it, right? To be my servant, to be humble, to do what I've asked, and man, it's just fantastic. So, then came there two women. Now, here we go. Here's Solomon's wisdom and his prosperity and all these things start to happen and you and I know all about this story about the woman uh, that comes the two women that are brought to Solomon it says there came two women and they were both harlots now this is interesting isn't it that were harlots unto the king and they stood before him and the one woman said, O oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass on the third day that as I was delivered, that this woman delivered also, and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died. Right? because she laid on it. She went to sleep, fell over, rolled over on it, right? And she arose at midnight and she took my son. Great day, this woman's child died and she took my son. And when I rose up in the morning to give suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son. It wasn't even my son, right? And the other woman said, nay, but the living one is my son. The dead is her son. 
And this they said, but the dead is thy son and the living is thy son. So basically one child is dead and they're making claims. Both of these women are making claims for this child. So then said the king, the one saith, this one is my son that liveth and thy son is dead. And the other say, nay, but this is my son. So blah, blah, blah. So the king said, bring me a sword. This don't sound good, does it? The king says, now this is a true story, folks. This, the king says in verse 24 of the third chapter of 1 Kings, bring me a sword. So the king said, divide the living child in two. Now, can you imagine this in this, you know, it's court. There's people standing around and King Solomon says, okay, give me the sword or, you know, whoever was the swordsman. I want you to cut this child in half right now. Bring me a sword. They brought a sword before the king, and the king said, Divide the living child in two <clears throat> and give half of the one to the one lady and half to the other harlot. The one lady says harlot, right? So then spake the woman whose living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son, and she said, Oh, my Lord, give her the living child. So what's going on? The one, okay, said, ho, 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 no, 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 don't split that child. She can have the child. Now, we look at that as just pure common sense, right? Because she loved that child, right? But what goes on? What, what's next? Oh, my Lord, give her the living child and in no way slay it. But the other woman said, let it neither be mine nor hers, but divide it. See, there was bitterness there, wasn't there? And, and, you know, then the king answered and said, Give her the living child and in no wise slay it because she is the true mother of the child. And all of Israel heard of his judgments, which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. Hey, folks, is the wisdom of God in you to do judgment? Well, I don't have to judge someone else, but you know what I have to do? I have to judge my own sins because those are the ones that I'll be held accountable for. And by judging my own sins, God puts me in a position where I can be what he wants me to be. Folks, I hope you've had a great week of study. I've really enjoyed this. And we're going to get more into Solomon starting Monday. And it's just a great lesson. Uh, and, and once again, so many times we think, well, I can't live what God wants me to live. Or I used to be saved and I used to be a powerhouse in church but I've gotten off track. Listen, King David got off track, right? But he came back. King Solomon, here's a man that prayed everything so perfectly that God opened up the storehouse and gave him everything. Nobody was ever going to be smarter than Solomon before him, and nobody's ever going to be smarter than Solomon after him. That's pretty strong, right? So the point being this, folks, God's doing that same thing for you and me today. He's given us enough wisdom and enough sense. And if it says if you lack wisdom, I think it's in James or maybe it's in Proverbs. If you lack wisdom, ask of the Lord who will give it to you liberally, meaning he's not going to hold back wisdom from you. And you say, well, where do I get the wisdom from the Lord? You get it right here. See? So anyway, we got to roll. It's Friday. We're traveling today. So you guys have a wonderful weekend. Uh, a lot of driving. Looks like a lot of rain. So if you're going to be on the road today, be safe and be careful. We appreciate you. You guys make me excited to get up and be with you every morning to start my day out. Myrtle, so good to see you. Benita, we're continuing to pray for you. Stephanie, praying for your kids. Guys, there's a lot to be prayed about. Just leave your requests here. Let's pray for each other. Lord, we're thankful. Thankful for a Bible that has all we need to know to get to heaven in it. Thankful for your words of comfort. Thankful for your words of judgment that just show us that if we don't do what you tell us to do or what you've laid out in this Bible, we will not spend eternity with you. That's heartbreaking to those that aren't going to listen. But I tell you what, for those of us that are in this Sunday school and we're listening and we're learning these things and we know that you've got a plan to take us to heaven uh, when we leave here, we're excited about it. We're excited about the opportunity to be there in a place with you forever and ever. So Lord, please be with our men and women soldiers that are all over this world protecting us, that have left their families and been willing to go all the way to death for us. Sounds a lot like what Jesus was prepared to do for us. So bless those men and women soldiers. 
be with our policemen, our firefighters, and our first responders. These frontline folks are doing amazing things, whether they're helping us in these riots, whether they're uh, fighting the drug epidemic, whatever's going on, there's a lot of stress and a lot of crazy out here in society today. Please be with our school kids and our teachers and our school personnel. Please be with our hospitals and our nurses and doctors and staffs that are fighting this COVID. COVID is still out there, folks, and I know there's so many of you that think it's all been a big hoax, but talk to somebody that's almost died of it. Our real estate partner, Alicia, uh, ha has come out of it. She's healing up. She's made it home, so praise the Lord for that. But, folks, it's real, and I'm begging you to think about it. Uh, from the vaccine or whatever you got to do to can protect yourself because the people with the vaccine seem to be fighting this thing off pretty good. But Lord, we'd ask you to take COVID, Delta, whatever we're calling it this week and get it out of here. Help our government leaders to wake up and see what we need to do. Man, it is such a heartbreaking thing to think about all the things that a good leader could do that he wouldn't need help on. But you know what? As Christians, there's some things we can do today, too. And that says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek your face, Lord, that you would hear that prayer from heaven and you would heal the land and extend the day so we could tell more people about Jesus. And so at the end of the day, more of us would end up in a place called heaven with you for all eternity. Forgive us where we fail you. Lead us, direct us, and guide us with every step we make. And we praise you for who you are through the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, folks, we love you. We appreciate you guys. You all have a wonderful weekend, and uh, I couldn't think of a better group of people that I'd like to spend the morning with than you guys. So we'll see you soon. Have a great weekend.